Welcome to the Relationship Help Show, your time with Dr. Roberta Shaler, the Relationship Help Doctor. Through the magic of the internet, Dr. Shaler provides urgent and ongoing care for relationships in crisis to people throughout the world, and she's here for you now. Whether you are experiencing a momentary blow up or the crazy making of life with a partner, ex, child, or parent who is relentlessly difficult, you'll get your questions answered and enjoy her expert guests. Settle in with Dr. Roberta Shaler now. Leave the drama behind and find peace of mind on today's Relationship Help Show. Here's Dr. Shaler. Hello. Have you ever felt obligated to do something for someone? Have you ever felt that you absolutely had to do something when someone asks you? Or do you feel a really deep sense of duty that you must do it? or you should do it to be a good person. It's not about wanting to, that's not what I'm talking about today. It's about that feeling like you have to, or you're just not good enough, or you're not doing it right, or somebody won't like you, or there's an expectation that you do it, and if you don't live up to it, then you're just not good enough. Many of us live that way. And I'm going to tell you today about some thoughts on where that comes from and what you might want to consider because it's very important to reconsider our lives to, as my guest today, Filippo Voltaggio will say, recalibrate our lives. And that's something I talk about a lot. So maybe you learned to to meet the needs of others as a small child. Maybe your mom or dad's putting you on your first play date would say something like, you know, play nicely and play what the other children want to play and just get along, just get along. And so you took that in and you have a kind of undifferentiated brain when you're young. Our brains grow until we're 25. And then so you're like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. That's the right thing to do. There's a little part of you, no matter how little you were, that's going, hmm, not sure I like that. But that was the beginning of having to do what other people wanted you to do. And of course, we all had parents, and that's their job to tell us how to be and what to do and to give us an idea of how to make it well in life. So we're used to accepting that. We look to them for that because they're going to help us survive. They're going to help us because we're just born as little blobs. We're not like horses or cows. We don't pop out of our mothers, get licked off, and then leap up and jump around the meadow. We know we can't do that. We know that we're a blob sitting there, and we're 100% reliant on those giants in our lives to feed us and move us and change us and take care of us and not abandon us. So, of course, we get into a way of believing what the giants say. So, when they say to us, you know, you be nice and you go and play nicely with others. And that includes doing what they want to do, play what they want to play. And then they might have said, and they'll like you better. And in that went to that childhood brain. And maybe there are remnants of it still. Maybe it's still operating in full force. So I want to talk to you about that. Because don't get me wrong, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with compromising or ideally learning how to collaborate. That's all great. It's a good start. But when you're little with that undifferentiated brain, you take everything very literally. So what it ends up meaning to you is they matter, I don't matter. And you want to stamp your little foot and say, when's it my turn to have other people do what I want? And that's when it starts. And then there's school. And then you're learning about authority. And you're trying to learn something about fairness. And maybe, ideally, you'll learn something about justice. But you've got this programming that says, do what other people want you to do and they'll like you better. You know what I'm talking about? So do we actually take turns getting our needs met? Patterns develop within us. And if the pattern is that I do what other people want and then they'll like me, it gets ingrained in us. 
and so does the underlying resentment you know what i'm talking about right there's that underlying what about me feeling or i don't want to do that or do i have to and we often smother that feeling by saying if i were a good person i would so then we don't examine that feeling we don't get in touch with it and then we can't make a change if one is is a better idea so it may have become an automatic response for you and you wouldn't be alone so many of my clients have found that pretty much they're doing things that way down deep they were told to do to make them a good person or to do it well or do it right when they were young and they've done the best they could with all that but it hasn't turned out so well and now we have to look at it again we have to look at our thoughts and our values and what's going on here and how do i catch up with myself how do i become aligned with who i want to be by living my values my vision for my life my beliefs about everything and my current goals and we feel resentment and then because of the early training of giving in to others we may beat ourselves up for feeling resentful so not only are we getting that feeling from the outside but then we add to it we add to that fire of resentment and it builds and then we try to damp it down and say well good people don't feel resentment and then still it's there and so we get into a cycle and if that cycle is playing within you let's talk soon because you don't have to stay with this you can move towards what i think is absolutely essential in any relationship three things there must be equity reciprocity and mutuality and if we don't have equity reciprocity and mutuality our relationships are going to be lopsided and there's often going to be resentment and that resentment builds sometimes it becomes a full-time job just to stay on top of the resentment and then often you'll find yourself feeling ill and that's not good so let's talk about that because you can step away from the should model and step towards the could model which is a really great beginning because when we uncover that we may be living from old shoulds that we accepted and we say wow i didn't know that was in there we open ourselves to possibilities of what life could be like and so we're not obligated to meet the needs of others it's a choice and we want to be making that choice very very consciously we may have had too many shoulds in life did you do you when you think about it is that is there a lot of well you should do this and you should do that and good people do that so you should you know that gets deeply ingrained in us from a very early age those parents are charged with teaching us but they could only teach us what they knew and they could only parent us by the way that they knew how to parent and many did a great job and many did an adequate job and then there are some that just didn't have that gift to give so we may be a little muddled about that because parents can only teach us what they know so maybe you had parents with good boundaries most people don't and one of the reasons you feel resentful is you feel obligated to meet the needs of others because somewhere back there you were told you should do that that nice people do that that worthwhile people do that that people people like do that sunny familiar at all and now you're a grown up and now you get to decide what is true for you and what's appropriate for you and what's right for you and sometimes we need some help with that so remember i'm always available you can go to forrelationshiphelp.com and you can find ways to talk about that with me no matter where you live in the world because we do it right here uh, on this platform through video so now you're a grown up and you get to decide but maybe you're so busy that you're not giving yourself time to be reflective 
you're rushing as fast as you can and you're distracting yourself from these things. So I heartily recommend that if this is resonating with you this morning, that you stop and say, I need to take some time. Maybe it's only 20 minutes, but you take some time and say, what am I up to? What's, what's working for me? What's not working for me? Do I feel resentment? Where's that resentment coming from? And see if you can trace back that breadcrumb trail to where it started. And then you can begin to move forward to where you'd like to be. I know how to escape the shoulds. I had to. I was an only child. I had two sets of shoulds coming at only me for my entire lifetime until I moved away. And I did that at 17. So that's what happens to us. And if it happened to you, then it has certain consequences and it might be something worthwhile for you to have a look at. So sure, there are people that we love and we're absolutely delighted to do things for them. And these relationships that we love hopefully are equitable, meaning that I could ask someone to do something for me and I could hear either yes or no and it wouldn't disturb the friendship. But then there are some friendships that they ask you to do something and you feel that obligation. I have to do it. If I don't do it, there's going to be a problem. That little fire of resentment there. So then sometimes we do things for people because it aligns with our values. It's who we really are or who we most want to be. So we do it. And then we just practice it from that point of view. And in fact, there are others who ask for help. And we don't want to do it, but we do it anyway. And maybe it's a one-time thing, and that's great. But we do tend to build up if there's somebody who keeps asking and asking and asking. Why? Because we don't have that equality, reciprocity, and mutuality. So then there are these people who ask and ask and ask, and our whole body rebels, right? Everything just goes on high alert. Oh, no, there they go again. Our stomachs tighten and our souls almost shiver. A couple of weeks ago, I was invited to be the keynote speaker for the second anniversary meeting of the San Diego Daughters.org chapter. Now, Daughters.org is a wonderful organization that helps uh, women who are taking care of their aging parents. And many times, taking care of aging parents is fraught with difficulties. That's why they invited me in, because you're going to have so many personalities engaging and professionals and siblings and attorneys and doctors and uh <laughs> long-term care facilities. I mean, so many pieces of the puzzle. And they're all going to have their pulls and they're all going to have their shoulds and they're all going to have people who are either very helpful, ranging from very helpful and absolutely wonderful to people who like to have power over other people. And so you can imagine the range of responses in that room because maybe you're trying to work and raise children and do your life as well as taking care of aging parents. So it was fraught with the possibilities of obligation and resentment. And it sort of sounded like this. I went around the room and I got these kind of responses. I'm going to read them to you. I'm happy to take care of my parents because I have the time and it's my pleasure. They took care of me. I was brought up to respect my elders and it's the right thing to do, so I do it. If I don't do it, I don't know who will. My siblings are scattered around the country and I live closest, so it's on me. No one in the family is willing to help. I feel obligated, stuck, and burdened. Big range of responses. So whether you're taking care of aging parents or you've just got a flock of friends who have come to use you as their go-to person when they have a need or a want, uh, they all apply to you. You could be thinking the exact same thing when somebody asks you. You want to say ask somebody else, but you know that you're their go-to. 
and you don't want to damage the relationship. Or maybe you're not feeling assertive. Maybe you just don't feel that you have the right to speak up and say, no, that won't work for me. Did you know that no is a complete sentence? We've talked about that on the show before. So I'm sure on some days, each one of those people felt all of those things, if they were truly honest with themselves. It's not one way all the time, because feelings are fleeting. Feelings aren't facts. They change. Facts don't change. And feelings do change. And it's a big mixture of feelings, too. And and sometimes you've already said yes before you figure out that you have a conflict within yourself. And then you feel, oh, well, I gave my word. And integrity means standing by your word. But did you know you can change your word? Did you know that you could ring up somebody and say, in, in the moment I thought that it would be all right, I find that it is not all right, and I am changing my word on that. You can do that. As long as you're proactive and not passive aggressive. Passive aggressive would be just not to do it not say anything about it and then wait for somebody to blame me for it then you tell them it was their fault for asking you in the first place but when you're a healthy adult you don't play those games so you would call someone up and say i'm changing my word i find that i cannot do that i i do not have the time or i whatever is true for you because if you don't the cycle will continue and the cycle can be crazy making And I don't invite you to want to be any part of crazy making, right? (laughs) You can opt out of crazy making. You know, so often I talk about my favorite topic, which is helping people who are with relentlessly difficult and disturbing people. Those are the people that I call hijackals. And if you're with one of those, you'll constantly be put in the middle of these feelings because their thing is to have power over you, to control you. And if they've been doing that, you don't feel sometimes powerful enough to speak up. And when you don't speak up, you feel resentment. Then when you feel resentment enough, you explode. And then a hijackle makes you wrong for exploding because no good, nice person would, right? You understand that cycle. And if you think you might be with a hijackle, remember my free ebook at hijackles.com. That's hijack, A-L-S.com, called How to Spot a Hijackle. So there's a resource there for you. But if you happen to be with a hijackal, they do that on purpose to have as much control of you as possible. They want to be the puppet master. And if you allow them to be the puppet master, then you are enabling and condoning their behavior. And one of the things that is really important is for you to pry their fingers off control of your life. Very important. So hijackals, that's the way their minds work. And their feelings of abject fear within themselves are so strong that they have to control you. They have to control their environment. And they do their very best to do that. And that's all they know how to do to be safe. And so that's why hijackals almost never change. Sometimes they change for a little while, but they revert back. And so sadly, you cannot change their lives. So don't try. That's not your job. That's their job. It's their life. You take care of you and you take care of your life. And why won't they change? Well, they think they're perfect. So then it must be you. (laughs) And so that cycle is one to get out of. And second, any efforts you have will fail if you're trying to change them. And then they'll give you the sense that you're not good enough because even you failed at changing them. So they have you just where they want you and they have every plan of keeping you there. So What can you do to figure this out for yourself? Well, as I said earlier, first of all, figure out where you got this first feeling that you must and have to do what other people tell and ask. Um, The parent part, that's great. They needed to do that. But if you're continuing to feel that way, I invite you to examine it. And because it's not fair and because of the brain development, you accepted it and now it's time to re-examine it. And so... If you have a severe case of the shoulds, I invite you to re-examine the whole thing. Let's do it together. You're an adult now. You get to choose. And you examine where that sense of duty has come. You sort it out and you go forward in life evaluating your values and what you most want to be and have and do in your life. And that includes how you respond to other people 
who have requests or maybe if you're with a hijackal demands so you need to stay in tune with yourself don't be living with the leftovers of your young life catch up with yourself get up to date with yourself be here completely now fully present and say ah this is not working for me what would what would I need to change to make what's working for me? And you will need to take some time for yourself. And that may seem like a real difficulty in your life and your schedule, but you matter. You may have to give up something to have that time, but you matter. I can't say that loudly enough. You know, in the back of the book that I wrote with Charles Anderson, Soul Solitude, taking time for our souls to catch up, great big letters. It says, you matter. So if any of this is landing on your heart right now and making absolute sense, let's talk. It's time to step away from what's not serving you. Just go to fourrelationshiphelp.com and make a date to talk. Feeling burdened or obligated or dutiful is not good unless you're in the military, and I'm guessing you're not. So figure it out. Recalibrate your life and time and go forth with more peace, more joy, and a greater sense of confidence. Let's talk soon. Hello, this is Dr. Roberta Shaler. Are these stories and questions on today's show sounding familiar to you? Are you ready to say no more to the abuse from toxic people in your life? I'm so glad. You matter and you deserve to have real love, true love in your life. Love from yourself and love from others. Not that demeaning, discounting, and dismissive masquerade that a hijackal pretends is love. I can help you regain yourself, your self-esteem, your self-confidence after a life with a hijackal, whether it was your partner, an ex, a parent, or a child. Let's work together now. For individual sessions or small group coaching, visit forrelationshiphelp.com slash join. Talk soon. Well, today we're going to be talking with someone who will join us soon, and his name is Filippo Votaggio. And he is a remarkable kind of Renaissance fellow. He's done so many wonderful things in life, including receiving an award from President Obama. And he's written books. He's moved away from a Fortune 500 career. He's done so many things that uh, we're very interested in knowing how he recalibrated his life. So welcome, Filippo, to the program. Thank you for having me on, Roberta. It's such a pleasure. Yes, I'm so glad that you're here. And I want to tell folks a little bit more about you. As you could hear, I was doing that already when you joined. Um, you've written you've written a wonderful book. We're going to talk about the book, The Little Dog That Could. And you speak and you perform. You've done so many things. And you've not been afraid to step up in life. And that's, of course, why you have the Life Changes show, <laughs> to help people understand that they, too, can step into things. So Filippo Votaggio is a life coach. He specializes in, guess what, changes and the wholeness and expansion of the self. That's exciting, right? Absolutely. And he is the creator of The Calibration a workshop series and a public speaker and as i said the host of the life changes show and the author of the book a little dog that could a true story of life love and miracles well who wouldn't want to hear about life love and miracles so tell us what causes you to feel the most joy right now well, actually, uh, this very moment, and I also have to say thank you so much. Uh, you were our guest on the Life Changes show, and it was a pleasure having you on, and it's a pleasure being here with you on your show. Uh, I, I do my best to try and find the joy in every moment. And it's interesting. I snapped a picture the other day of a, of, um, a golfer. And he was in the sand pit, uh, hitting a ball outside the sand pit. And the reason I snapped the picture was not because he was hitting a ball to, to get outside the sand pit, 
but because he had eight or nine more balls lined up. <laughs> and those balls didn't all go into the sand pit. He put them there because as important it is to learn how not to get into the sand pit, it's important to learn how to get out of it because invariably in life, as so many of us have learned or come to experience, we end up there whether we want to or not. So getting out of it is just as important. <laughs> well, it may be more important because the empowerment is knowing how to get out. Right, and then you don't have to worry about if you're getting <laughs> exactly. Or so you might it, enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, so I may be the world's best person for getting out of a sand pit, and I can help others do it too. And maybe then I can move on to learning how not to get in a sand pit situation, and right. that would be that would be growth. But you know, we have situations like that in our lives. So um, one of those situations is that we find ourselves in the relationship with the same kind of person that we left purposefully over and over and over. I know with my clients, Filippo, um, people who are in relationship with hijackals, some of them will tell me that they have not only met or dated, but actually serially married several hijackals in a row before they woke up. So why would a person keep attracting someone who treats them badly or poorly? Well, like you were saying at the top of the show, uh, so eloquently actually, is is it's that first imprint and it's not just the first imprint. I like to say it's the, the strongest imprint or most dominant imprint or the one that's most dramatic. So for example, maybe we watched our parents have a particular relationship and then we go on to replicate that because if we think about it, at, at, at an early age when our mind, like a brand new computer, we put something into the computer, we put something in our mind, it's the only thing in there. <laughs> so, or it's one of the few things in there. So the computer is not bogged down with other things. So it's not slower. Uh, the brain of a child is not bogged down with other things. It's just got that to focus on. So if that's what they're seeing, well, then that's the predominant thought and creating an imprint. When I say most dominant, maybe the parents weren't around. For example, they're, they're take, they've got an au pair or somebody taking care of them. So what becomes their first imprint of a relationship? It might be a family on television. So mm -hmm. I, I, I grew up, I used to say that Florence Henderson, who I later went on to meet and tell her this story, actually, who was the mother on um, uh, the Brady, Brady Bunch, Bunch, right, was my second mother because, <laughs> because I felt like I needed a second mother in the sense that my mother had come from Italy and was not born and raised here, did not speak the language at the time, and so... I felt like I had my Italian mother who taught me these things and then my American mother who taught me these things. Now, I didn't know that's what I was doing. Right. I was imprinting. So, so in a sense, that became my most dominant imprint as far as the American mother and the American relationship is concerned, her relationship with uh, whatever his name was. Um, <laughs> obviously, she was more important to me than him. What was his name? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> I guess so, I have the same issue. <laughs> and then, and then, and so, so that would be the, the most dominant imprint. Or sometimes it's the most dramatic um, or invasive imprint. So something happens with a female figure in our life uh, or a male figure or a male and female relationship that, that is so strong and so dramatic, good or bad that creates that imprint that overrides the dominant or the, the first imprint. So one of those scenarios or a combination of those, it's what gets imprinted. And then lo and behold, surprise, surprise, we recreate it over and over and over again. And, you know, interestingly enough, I was at an event last night, a wonderful event, and I happened to be sitting next to a beautiful young lady and when it came her time to speak, we all had to introduce ourselves. She was sitting on the edge of her chair and she started to speak and I watched her slowly and then quickly start to 
fall off her chair. And I grabbed her arm really quickly and she said, oh my God, you saved me from falling. And I, I felt like there was, there was a, 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 like a heaviness to those words, like it really meant something to her. And I thought, what does that mean? And she went on to say, she said, you know, it's interesting, I fall all the time. And she said that she fell when she was three years old. She remembers falling down the stairs or something. And now she realizes that she's, she's come to terms with it and that she's going to fall the rest of her life. But at least she's not going to be traumatized by it. Even though the last time she fell, she fractured both her ankles, but she healed. And so already you hear it in that statement, yeah. you know, it imprinted when she was three. And now for the rest of her life, though she's okay with it, she's just going to keep doing that. Yeah, and so many times, though, using the examples that you're giving, which I believe are so accurate, it, with my work, people being with a hijackal, a relentlessly difficult, disturbing people, person, uh, if that's your model in life, then you spend your entire life trying to please that person while there's underlying resentment. This carries right through to the rest of your life. But because of that subconscious imprint, those people who behave like those people when our brain was underdeveloped when we were young, that imprint took place and we think, okay, that's how I deserve to be treated. Mm -hmm. And so we go on and replicate those relationships. So I can't help but, but create the analogy between the sand trap and the woman falling. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> right. Because she had created her own sand trap. Like, I don't like it in the sand trap, but I'm going to accept that I'm a sand trap dweller. And it, she had options, didn't she, Filippo? Yes, although she doesn't know, and she wasn't asking. Right? So it, she she actually was in a group of, of life coaches and, and, and healers and all that. And, and so she didn't think to ask. As a matter of fact, she's a life coach herself, and, and I don't know her specific field. And I'm sure she's a very fine life coach because so many of us teach what we need to learn. So, so we're in that field because we're wanting to learn it for ourselves. So, Yeah, I agree with that. Um, and I think that, that acceptance can be a double-edged sword because she can accept that she falls often and the other guy can accept that he lives in a sand trap. But let's hope that nobody feels like they don't have options. Right. And I like the respectful part that you said, well, she wasn't asking, so I wasn't responding. Um, but that's why we do our shows, isn't it? To give people the idea that, oh, there's a new idea. Maybe there's a new possibility. Maybe there's another way to be, and I could be open to some options. Absolutely, and I found a reason to give her my card, which has the Life Changes show on it, and my Facebook information, so that should she have gone on the Facebook last night or this morning, she will have found that I was on this show talking about this, and so she'll be hearing it right now. <laughs> Well, that was that was a good idea because immediately she could she could if she can hear it, mm -hmm. and I, if you're listening, honey, I hope you hear it. There are possibilities. You don't have to keep falling down. Absolutely. And, yeah. So, so this repetition that we get into, what do you think is the first step besides recognizing that you're in repetition? What do you think the first thing a person needs to consider to begin the journey out? Of the repetition. I love that. And it's interesting, you actually used the word uh, and then you said catch up with yourself as well. The word I use is recalibration. So you used it as well. And and so I've, I've developed this course, the recalibration, in the sense that it's that it's that grand when we when we sit down as an adult and and say we have options. We, we want something different, or we might actually want what we have. We just don't know it. And, and that's an interesting take on it, too. Two things I, 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 I want to add to our previous conversation. Uh, siblings could be that first imprint. How our sibling treated us or how we were treated by our sibling, or best friends or, or people that were around a lot 
the, the housekeeper or whatever it is, the au pair. So, so there are a myriad of, of relationships that we could look at, and especially today with video games and all that, that really mm. seep into our, our unconscious mind. So we, we want to look at all that. And sometimes we can't look at it by just saying, hmm, what influenced me as a child? Because asking that question is a lot like things that we thought about before. So in the recalibration, we go around the question. And so we say things like, what did people think of you? What did people say about you? What do you think people thought of you? And I love it when people say, because it's a wonderful thing, but I, and yet at the same time, there might be something there to explore. I love it when people say, well, I don't care what people think. <laughs> you, you, you know, that's, that's great on, on one level. And maybe your unconscious does or did. And if it did, then there's an imprint, right? Or the people that say, I want to talk about the future. I don't want to talk about my past. There's nothing wrong with my past. I figured it all out. And I'd say, well, uh, why the reaction? You know, mm -hmm. if, if we were talking about apple pie or something, you might get excited in a good way, but, but you won't get mad. Unless there's a problem. I don't want to talk about apple pie. My grandmother used to make apple pie and she used to beat me before we ate it. I, I, I don't know. But, you know, we have imprints on this stuff. Um, so, so we look at our past, yes. But we look at it in a way of like the outside in. And it kind of tricks us into figuring out what the inside is telling us and how it's being mirrored on the outside. That's so well said, yes, because these imprints have impact mm. and we can't deny the impact. You know, using your analogy, okay, apple pie, I remember the smell, I remember my grandmother's hands, I remember family times. Great Im imprint, lovely impact, great associations with apple pie. But if, as you said, my grandmother beat me every day before she gave me the apple pie, apple pie is a trigger for me. Right. And then I don't want to look at it. So I like, I, of course, I love the fact you call your, your offering the cal recalibration because I've used that word for years. And I think that's exactly what we need to do. So I hope everybody will take advantage of what it is that you're, you're offering at that seminar because we do need to take that opportunity to recalibrate. And the question that I would have when somebody says to me, well, I don't want to look at my past. My question is often, so um, what, why are we here? <laughs> <laughs> because you came to see me remember <laughs> there was something that that you wanted to work out and if everything is great then what is there to work out and that's an important question because if you have a you may even ha not have an answer to that question and that's okay it was that you had a feeling of moving towards something that you knew you wanted that you intuitively felt you needed and yet when you get there your fear kicks in that anything that about your shell is going to be maybe picked at or unfortunately shattered and you're very fearful about that so you put up the teflon and say there's nothing wrong with me and i'm okay and my life is fabulous and this question still stands so what brought you into the room today why can't we say no to people you know i was talking about that before you joined us what do you think the whole thing about obligation of burden and duty is about yeah i was i was listening to that and i, I again i really liked how you were saying it and what a loaded question. There, there, there are so, so many things that, that actually tie into one thing in particular ties into what we've been talking about so far. So we're, we're talking about how we, like, for example, if we had a hijackle to use your word in our life at one point uh, or first imprint or what have you, and then we keep repeating that the opposite is also true. Actually, there are other uh, possibilities, but for the sake of keeping it simple, there, there are at least two possibilities. The opposite is true. So, for example, supposedly a study was done on, on twins, and they asked each of the twins independently, 
uh, of, of different aspects of their life. And so this is about as close as the same person as you can get, uh, the, the biological maternal twins. And so, for example, one study that I found really interesting uh, highlighted this, that they asked one twin why they were an alcoholic. And that twin says, well, look at my parents. They were alcoholics, so duh, in a sense. (laughs) And they asked the other twin, why are you not an alcoholic? And why don't you even drink? And they said, well, look at my parents, duh right? So somebody who grew up with a hijackal might find themselves staying away completely from that kind of relationship, potentially getting them into another kind of relationship where they're the dominant one and they're the hijackal, right? right. So, so, they're, so, so it's interesting to, to know that we could be on, at least in this scenario, either side. So uh, if, if there are no hijackals in our life, might we be the one? Right? So. Well, it's quite possible, but uh, unlikely. Um, but most of us have a hijackal in our life, that infuriating, frustrating, difficult, and disturbing person. And, and I, I think that's going to happen. Actually, it's going to happen uh, regardless. There was something that happened yesterday, actually, where I innocently did something uh, while I was driving down the road. And I instantly realized afterwards that what I did was not a very nice thing, but the person uh, wasn't there when I did it. So uh, long story, I won't get into it, but the point is, is I, I, I drove away feeling bad because I didn't want that for the person. And I was sorry for the person that I was the one that did that to them, even though I didn't do it intentionally. So it technically wasn't my fault, but I just knew driving away or or leaving that experience, that person thinks probably, oh, that's just the world showing me that I'm worthless or I'm not. So, so whatever they're experiencing, they're attracting even from an innocent person. So somebody who thinks, oh, I'm, I'm not worthy and people always leave me or people always tell me what to do, then they're going to attract that scenario, even if the person is completely innocent in that situation, which brings us back to the no. Um, I think one of the things you said that is so important is knowing yourself. Who, who we are in that situation, who we are in that relationship, who we are in relationship to the most relationship, most important relationship in our life, ourselves. Right. And so in that case, I love what you said, if something doesn't feel right to be able to say no, but sometimes we don't know if it feels right or wrong because we don't know ourselves. So a lot of times it's hard to say no when we don't know how we feel about it to begin with. So a good place to start is with us. I think everything has to start there um, because, you know, again, if you're with a hijackal, then you have to look at, well, I'm participating in this, so maybe I should spend the time looking at me rather than them. Mm -hmm. And then I can, to use your great term, recalibrate and decide who I want to be and how I want things to be at this point in my life rather than what I've accepted throughout it. And And that's an important thing. And I think it's also important to remember that you are allowed to say no, that healthy, emotional grown ups, emotionally healthy grown ups too, are people who can ask a question and are equally capable of accepting yes or no as the answer and moving forward because they're secure within themselves, they're confident within themselves, and they're not needy or dependent on other people. And when we come to that place, then we can hear yes or no and move on and have a conversation. But if we're in a place of depletion or we're expecting people to always say no to us, we need to recalibrate because that is not the case. You have options. You have possibilities for growth. I I have uh, an anecdote that is, is the opposite of that, where as the facilitator of the recalibration, I was the one saying no 
to somebody who wanted me to say yes. So, so it, it, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite stories, but there are so many because so much happens in these workshops and I can't wait to make it available like in a webinar or something like that where we could help so many more people. But in the meantime, it, it is, uh, it, 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 the group intensives, it, invariably what happens is something within the group dynamic supports the further growth, as you know, when, when we get into groups sometimes of like-minded people. So in this particular case, I had somebody that was coming. This is when I was doing the recalibration every week for eight weeks. Wow. We, we've, we've turned it into a weekend thing because it's hard to get people to be able to sustain that. But uh, so this woman was coming and she brought me some, some, some treats um, on the first day of the workshop. And I said, well, thank you so much. This is very sweet. And um, the, the next week she brought me more treats and, and I, and they were lovely and I was happy to receive them, but something triggered in my mind. And I said, this is lovely. Thank you so much. And I'm going to enjoy them. Please next week, uh, please don't, don't bring anything for me. Uh, or I don't remember exactly how I said it. And, and she says, but I love doing it. And I said, yes, but nonetheless, just uh, you're paying like everybody else. Please feel comfortable just coming and paying and being part of the group. Then that she left, she came back the week after and instead brought something for everybody. Yeah. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting way around what I was trying to get at. So I said, this is really lovely. And, the, the, and then I, privately I said to her, next week, please come and don't bring anything, not for me, not for anybody. And then I'll tell you why, but don't bring anything. She didn't come the week after. Mm -hmm. And she texted me just before and said, I'm sorry, I'm sick. And I know people that knew her and they said, she's really sick. And so I... I, I don't doubt that her body was reacting, and so I'm sure she was really sick. However, it started in her consciousness, or even in her, her unconsciousness. The week after, she came and quietly sat in the back and was a, a wreck. And she, uh, uh, and then the week after that, she and didn't say a word really. The week after that, she. Uh, she came and I used her as an example without letting people know that I was using her as an example. I said, there, there are people who think they have to give in order to be accepted, to be liked, to be loved, even when they can't give, even when they're not able to give. And I know that her financially, her situation was kind of dire, um, but she was, she was, doing this because she felt she had to. And I didn't say who it was, and I stopped right there, and I said, so learning how to accept ourselves, not because we gave somebody a gift, but because we are, just for being. And she surprised the heck out of me and everybody in the class. She ran from the back of the room and came and hugged me and started crying and held me, and she said, thank you, you... You, you helped me, you see me, you, you, you accepted me for me. I've never had anybody not want something from me. No, yeah, such a powerful story. Absolutely. So we can see why the recalibration is a very important event. So if you're interested in knowing more about Filippo's work, go to thecalibration.com. The recalibration.com. Uh, the recalibration and also go to lifechangesshow.com because you want to hear all of that. Um, it's been just a pleasure to have you with us. And what a great story to end on because we can say no and it can be a good thing. And that's a great thing. So thank you so much for being with us. Great. If you'd like to um, interact with Filippo's work, I've given you the URLs. Go to therecalibration.com and lifechangesshow.com. And uh, you can certainly have more of Filippo. And I hope I do too. So thank you. Goodbye. Hi, this is Dr. Roberta Shaler. Handling hijackles is exhausting. It's never-ending, 
an endless cycle of crazy-making, alienation, and constant drama. And cycles are difficult to step out of, I know, because I've been there too. And that's why I reach out to you to offer the insight, skills, and strategies you need to heal. My small group programs, Handling Hijackles and Hijackle Recovery and Rediscovery, will shortcut your journey to healing, to save your sanity, and to stopping the crazy making. Visit forrelationshiphelp.com slash join now and let's talk soon. Wow, we've learned a lot today. There's been a lot of food for thought. We go back to the earlier time when we're talking about what to do when you feel resentment and obligation and burden. And there are options. There are always options. And sometimes we get a little stuck with that. We don't think there are options or we're of the mindset that, well, it always works like that. And for me, it always goes like that. No, there are 360 degrees of options. And sometimes you just need a little help or insight to get through that. I had someone uh, a while ago, uh, I may have mentioned this to you previously, who on a Friday evening went and started reading my work online at forrelationshiphelp.com and she wrote and said, I need help. I need to have an appointment. I need to talk to you. My hijackal boyfriend wants me back. She didn't use the word hijackal, but she said, this fellow that I've rejected wants me back and I'm thinking about it. And by the end of the weekend, she wrote to me and said, I don't need an appointment anymore. I went to forrelationshiphelp.com. I read everything there. Then I went to your YouTube channel for relationship help and I listened to everything. And then I read three of your books. And uh, I know the answer is an absolute no. And the light is on and shining brightly. And I will not have that person back in our lives. So sometimes we just need something that intervenes. Maybe the conversation with Filippo Votaggio that we just had. Maybe it woke something up. Maybe one of those stories. Maybe you are that person who feels that you have to give, give, give in order to have people like you or to be good enough. And many people feel like that because of how they were brought up. It's not your fault. It's not about fault or good or bad or right or wrong. It's just that that's not satisfying to you in your life. It's not bringing you what you want. It's not helping you feel good about yourself. So it may be time to look at those things. Because if you have a severe case of the shoulds, I invite you to re-examine the whole thing. You're an adult now. You get to choose. You get to go back and re-examine each little piece that you've been given and see what's in your bag of tricks and see which ones you would like to retire and which ones you would like to put in that are fresh and new. Because you want to be choosing your life and choosing your responses and choosing the way you see life. It's all about perception. And maybe from some early experiences, your perceptions got a little off. Maybe it's a little skewed to think that nobody likes me, everybody hates me, and I'm going to go out and eat worms. Or like the person in the segment before that Filippo was talking about, who has accepted the fact that she's always going to fall down. Maybe she doesn't have to be always falling down. Maybe she doesn't have to have that risk in her life, but has she looked at the options and the possibilities? So have you examined where your sense of duty obligation comes from? And is it something that makes sense to you now? Have you sorted out when it's okay with you and when it's not okay with you? Because that's absolutely key. And have you spent time looking at your values now, not the ones you were given, but the ones that you decide on now, the ones that you say yes to now. Because you don't want to be living on the leftovers of other years or of your upbringing or of other experiences. In a relationship, that can be disastrous because if you still have that mindset from a sad or bad relationship, You'll often be fearful that the new person will behave like the old person and you even put the old person's face on the new person and then there's very little hope for the relationship turning out well. And that's because we didn't use that term. We didn't recalibrate. We didn't get up to date with what would work well for us at this point in our life. So if you're feeling obligated 
and it's not because you choose to accept it, but it's something that is causing you to stockpile resentment. Now, stockpiles are there to be used at a later date, and they often ignite at the most inopportune moments. You'll blow up at somebody you love because you're feeling burdened and resentful about someone else. We don't want to be doing that. You don't want to be doing that because then you feel badly and then you've got another issue to clear up and that's not good. So give yourself the opportunity to figure that all out. Let's talk soon because you matter. You absolutely matter. And you must believe that to your deepest core. Then you must begin to create a life that demonstrates you matter, that's in alignment with your values, your vision, your beliefs, and your purpose. And then you can emerge in a new way, recalibrated to use Philippe's expression, and have a life that you appreciate more and you feel appreciated. And you're delighted to wake up every morning and say, hey, I get to be me again. I get to be me in relationship. I get to do things that do not cause me resentment because I've thought it through. And this is where we want to be. So before we talk again, go and visit forrelationshiphelp.com. If you think you have a hijackle in your life, figure it out. Get the free ebook, How to Spot a Hijackle, at hijackles.com. And until we talk again, be really kind to yourself and see if you can bring yourself up to date with who you most want to be. Talk soon. There you have it. If you want more, you can work with Dr. Shayla directly. She's eager to help you resolve your relationship issues. Have a question? Call in early to next week's show to talk with Dr. Shaler on air. Get her expert insights and advice by subscribing to her blog, newsletter, and YouTube channel. We're here for you. Don't be a stranger. Join us again next week. And in the meantime, visit 4relationshiphelp.com.